could disappear at any point if I wanted to. I would know how to do it, I would know all the stuff because I know mysteries. So, if I disappear, maybe I know how to do it. <laughs> Hello. Today we're talking about Ub Iwerks, the creator of Mickey Mouse. So our story starts in 1919 in Kansas City, USA. Walt Disney was a draftsman. Ub Iwerks was an animator. Ub goes, hey Walt, what if we were to put a live action person into an animated frame? Yes, that's it. They create something called the Alice Comedies but there's no money in it. Walt, though, is ambitious. He goes off to California, and he goes to the head of Universal Animation, Charles Mintz. He was like, this is amazing. I can use this. But the quality has to be as good. Walt's like, uh, get out here, ASAP. Yo, this is better than being in Kansas City, because Kansas City is like, you could, like, give me the deed to the city and I still wouldn't even stay there. He drives the seven days to California. He takes these... Oh, no. Let me back up. At this point, Ub came up with Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. So Oswald does great for Universal. And Walt goes to Charles Mintz and he says, Listen, we are f***ing killing it. Time for you to pay us some more money. And Mintz, Mintz looks at him and he laughs. He says, I'm gonna give you less money. And Mintz goes, I have signed all of your animators and I own Oswald. He's mine. Walt Disney vowed from that day, not only will I ever not own any character I create, I will never not own them. And they... He said to Ub, Ub, you with me? And Ub, yet again, left with Walt Disney. And Ub said to him, what are we doing, Walt? And Walt's like, we need a character, Ub. What do you got? What about a horse? Nope. What about a dog? Nope. <sighs> what about a cat? No, man, we got enough cats. We got Felix the cat. There's a lot of cats out there. What else you got? What about a mouse? Walt's like, yeah, let's do that. But what happened next was all Ub Iwerks, okay? So Ub locked himself in the studio and he churns out 600 to 700 frames a day, unheard of. He did two months of animation in two weeks and he created a character, Mickey Mouse. He sat down and drew that cartoon, plain crazy. Walt loves it, but he goes, you know what, we need something bigger. And Ub was like, what if we could sync sound to it? What if we did our next cartoon where we could see the action happening in the time with the music? And Walt was like, yeah, let's do sync sound. So Steamboat, so Steamboat, so Steamboat Willie comes out and it blows audiences away. They went, I can see that mouse whistling. I can hear the mouse whistling. Oh my God. This mouse is whistling along with what his mouth is doing. It's a sync sound. There were standing ovations. Mickey Mouse became an icon overnight. He was referenced in movies and songs, and it creates Disney. Like, this em embellishes their minds to everybody. They know that this is like, the game has changed. With the added pressures of Mickey doing really well, Disney, he wanted to oversee every bit of production. Hey, you gotta meet this timing sheet and we gotta be here by then and productivity. Now at a party in Hollywood, a little kid came up to Walt Disney. He's like, hey, Mr. Walt Disney, I love Mickey Mouse. Would you draw me a picture of him? Walt's like, sure kid, I'll draw you a picture of Mickey Mouse. And he handed the paper to Ub Iwerks and Ub goes, Whoa, are you kidding me? This is, what? No, I'm out of here. 
where was I? Ub and... Oh, Walt Disney? And Ub starts iWorks animation. Crazy stuff happened in his cartoons. You know, girls' dresses would blow off and, you know, animals would lose limbs. Like, it was anarchy. But the Hayes Commission comes in. Those are the guys who were starting to put uh, limitations on what you could and couldn't show. And they were like, this is not gonna fly anymore. So that was the end of iWorks animation. A friend of Ub's is working at Disney Studios still. He's like, Ub's out of work. You could use him. Walt agrees to have Ub for lunch. He says, Ub, I want you back. Please come work for me. And Ub looks at him and he says, Walt, I want to come back and work for you. But I will never work for you in animation. I want to work for you in photographic effects. And Walt is like, yeah, you're the guy for that. Come and do that for me. He was a rock star for Walt. He, he, he built stuff so they could uh, do Mary Poppins, the penguin dance. He wins a technical Oscar for that. Ub Iwerks had his hand in every single ride at Disneyland, creating the special effects. And Ub died a Disney legend. So this is a real Disney ending. Or, as I like to think, as I like to think, this is an iWorks ending. Because he was the man. The Ub. Ub. Uh, what the f kind of name's Ub? Hello, I'm Allison Rich, and today we will be talking about Agatha Christie. <laughs> okay. okay. Our story begins in England. It's 9.45 p.m., December 3rd, 1926. Famed mystery writer, Agatha Christie, she's kind of like the Stephen King of the 1920s, packed a small suitcase, walks out of her house, and she disappears. Dun, dun, dun. Mystery. Um, so the next day, a gypsy boy named George Best is walking along and then he comes to the bottom of a hill and he's like, whoa, what's this car doing here? Cars don't, aren't at the bottom of hills. And the car has the hood popped and a door is open and the lights are on. So he calls the police. The police come and Deputy Chief Constable William Kenward was like, you know what? I'm on the case and I'm gonna search the shit out of this. <laughs> and he looks inside and there's um, an expired license and a piece of paper and they say, Agatha? Christy. It's called vocal fry. So. <laughs> oh, okay. So he's like, oh my god, there's been a mystery with our own mystery writer. So then William Kenward is like, I'm gonna get scouts, I'm gonna get bloodhounds, I'm gonna get divers, I'm gonna get planes. We've never used planes before to search for someone, but you know what, I'm gonna fucking do it. Wow. They fucking were searching, like, to the max. But no dice, they don't find her shit. So Kenwood's like, okay. What I'm gonna do is, we're in the middle of a mystery, I'm gonna get two mystery writers to help find her. So he employs the help of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, AKA the writer of Sherlock Holmes, and then this lady, Dorothy L. Sayers, who we don't know. <laughs> but then somebody comes in and they're like, <gasps> record scratch, oh what? Don't worry about it, we found Agatha. <laughs> so 11 days after she disappeared, people are waiting, being like, what happened to famed mystery writer Agatha Christie? Where did she go? And she's like, I don't know, I can't, I can't help you. The police are like, what? Really disappointing, we were all searching for her, but she's just here. Um, so the police were left to just like piece together what had happened over those 11 days. So flashback. Okay, at the time, December 3rd, 1926, um, Agatha is having a tough time. Okay, she's 36 and life is punching her in the tits, okay? Like, her marriage is on the rocks, and her husband, Archie, is being a dick about it. He was like, I want to marry my secretary, but I'm already married. Ugh, this f***ing wife of mine. <laughs> so, she starts to exhibit the signs of a nervous breakdown. And Archie's like, hey, I'm gonna leave you. I'm gonna leave you for my secretary because I like her better than you. And she's like, wow, really cool. 
So she's like, you know what? I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna drive to London. So she starts driving to London. Bash, bam! Car accident, she gets into a car accident. So, 24 hours later, very mysteriously, she arrives at this spa and hotel called the Swan Hydropathic in Harrogate, 230 miles from where she had been. She checks in and she's like, hey, look at me. I'm wearing glasses. I wasn't wearing glasses before and I have a different hairstyle. What? Did she stage her own disappearance or did she have a mental break, Whoa. right? And she's like, my name is Teresa Neely. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. I just lost a child. Please lay off my back. I'm trying to recuperate. Um, that's all there is to it. <laughs> and the hotel people are like, okay, too much information. And then she's like, you know what? I'm gonna have a great time. I'm gonna like live it up. She gets some beauty treatments. She goes dancing. Chilling out, Max and Relax and all cool. <laughs> and she's reading her own story. Like, ooh, what's going on in the news? This is interesting. The weather's gonna be 78, and there's a lady who's missing named Agatha. Christy. <laughs> so Just be careful with that drink. It's fine, Derek. <laughs> so meanwhile, a chambermaid is like, wait, um, aren't you her? Aren't you this person? And she's just like, I don't know what you're saying. So the police- It's really bothering me. I'm oh, the so drink. afraid that no, that's no, no. gonna fall. Okay, so, <laughs> so. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> the police, they didn't know what to make of it. They were like, this is a publicity stunt for her new book, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. And some of them are like, this is her trying to get back at her husband. And others are like, she was in a car crash, so she had amnesia. Uh, but so Agatha's like, I don't know, you know what? But what I do know is I have a new attitude. I'm gonna divorce my husband, and I'm gonna go on to write 80 novels, and 66 are gonna be mystery novels. And I'm gonna be such a best-selling author that the only person who beats me, or literature that beats me is the Bible and Shakespeare. And that is exactly what she did. She was a huge success. She never speaks of the event again. Oh, P.S. I forgot to say that at one point, Agatha said to her sister, I could disappear at any point if I wanted to. I would know how to do it. I would know all the stuff because I know mysteries. So if I disappear, maybe I know how to do it. <laughs> okay, great. I feel like I could say my I'm Allison Rich now better. You want to do that? Do you want me to say that? Yeah. <sighs> Hello. <laughs> I'm Allison Rich. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Hello. Today we're going to talk about the Scopes Monkey Trial. In 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee, the economy was tanking. George Rappelier was a lawyer. One day, he saw an open letter in the newspaper. The ACLU, which is a new organization, offers to represent any teacher that wants to challenge the new Tennessee state law that forbids the teaching of evolution. This gives George an idea. Hey, if someone locally challenged this law, it could become the trial of the century and it could help the economy in our little town that nobody knows about. George Rappelier, who I want to call Applegay because it's the only way I can remember his name. Apple, yay! But his name is Rappelier. Right. <laughs> Don't yeah. call him Applegay. Okay, I call him Rappelier. So they pitched this idea to John Scopes of the Scopes Monkey Trial. Isn't it terrible that there's this law? You're a science teacher. Yeah, I'm a football coach. I also took... I'm a football coach. I also teach a little science. And I personally believe in evolution. The ACLU, they hire the greatest defense attorney probably ever, Clarence Darrow. Public schools should teach science and facts. That's, that's what I think. William Jennings Bryan comes in to fight for the Tennessee state statute, which he inspired. You can't teach evolution? Yeah, legally you can't teach it. 
On the first day of the Scopes Monkey trial, Williams, Jennings, Bryan, why does that not sound like I'm saying it right? Williams, Jennings, Bryan says to the court, if evolution wins, Christianity goes. And to that, Clarence Darrow argued that Scopes isn't on trial, civilization is on trial. This was like a boxing match. This was the trial of the century, and for the first time, people were able to hear a trial on their radios. There was a point in the trial in which Clarence Darrow asked scientists to explain the theory of evolution. But the judge in the Scopes Monkey trial was John Ralston, and he believed, I have been called on by God to be the judge in this case. So I don't care what all these scientists have to say. They can't give testimony. So Clarence Darrow decided, OK, all of my witnesses, they can't give testimony. So I'll ask someone who's an expert on the Bible to give testimony. Hey, what is your name, Brian? I know you're on the other side of this case, but why don't you go on the witness stand and I'll question you about the Bible. Now, William Jennings Bryan was so excited about this. He was like, oh my God, I'm gonna destroy you as a witness. I will go on the witness stand. Now, the judge didn't want him to do this. The judge was presidential. <laughs> <laughs> when Clarence Darrow puts William Jennings Bryan on the Bible, he asks, do you believe all the stories of the Bible literally? And the first answer of William Jennings Bryan is yes, the Bible is literal, I believe in it literally. And then asking him specific questions, where did Cain's wife come from? He made Adam and Eve, and then all of a sudden there are other people and Cain finds a wife. Where did, where did Cain's wife come from? Williams Denning Brian gets flustered and says, well, I, I leave that up to you agnostics to find out. That's all Clarence Darrow needed. So you're not interpreting the Bible literally. Clarence Darrow goes on to destroy Williams Denning Brian on facts. Are you still spinning or how do you feel? Well, I'm, I'm dizzy. Mm -hmm. I feel weird. I feel like I think I know where I'm going, and then I get utterly confused about where I thought I was going. Ah, nope. Gonna get Facebook responses for this. This was the complete destruction of Williams Jennings Bryan, and Williams Jennings Bryan looks like a fool. But Williams Jennings Bryan knows I have the most amazing closing argument to make. So, the entire country listening to the radio agrees Clarence Darrow just mopped the floor <laughs> with Williams Jennings Bryan. But Williams Jennings Bryan has the most amazing closing argument to make. Unfortunately for him, Clarence Darrow also knows that he probably has a pretty amazing closing argument. So when the judge asks, Clarence Darrow says, I don't want to make a closing argument. By law, Williams Jenny Bryant now cannot make his closing argument. He was like, you scumbag. You know what a f***ing scumbag you're being right now. He was just humiliated, and now he can't even make the closing argument he's been working on for the entire trial. Because he knew that, at least in the minds of those listening to the trial on the radio, he had won. And that's all he wanted because he knew he was going to lose. He wanted to lose so that a higher court could decide on this bigger law. Six days after the trial, Williams Jennings Bryan died, and the press reported that Williams Jennings Bryan didn't die of diabetes. He died of a broken heart. You think they were right? No, I think he died of diabetes. <laughs> Perfect ending. <laughs> I'm John Levenstein, and today we're going to be talking about Wayne Wheeler, the man responsible for prohibition. Cheers. Cheers, John. Wayne Wheeler would have hated that. Wayne Wheeler's family had a farmhand who was drunk, 
who was swinging a pitchfork, a hay fork, wildly, he said, Mom, that farmhand's acting sloppy. The farmhand stabs Wayne Wheeler in the leg. Wayne Wheeler said, ouch. Hey, yeah. what are you doing? You just stabbed me in the leg. What are you, drunk, you farmhand? Wayne Wheeler decided, alcohol is bad. I'm going to spend the rest of my life fighting against alcohol. And that's the, for the formative event of Wayne Wheeler's wife with, uh, of, okay. The, <laughs> the, okay. The, <laughs> the formative event of Wayne Wheeler's life. Wayne Wheeler in 1893 graduated from college. He goes to see Howard Hyde Russell from the Anti-Saloon League speak. I'm against alcohol. I'm against the way alcohol affects the American family. Men should not drink at the saloon, waste away their family's money, come home, hit their wives, hit their children, that shouldn't happen. After the speech, he said, I'm going to join your movement and I'll devote my life to making people not drink. Now, Wayne Wheeler with the Anti-Saloon League was a dynamo. He was just biking everywhere. He was biking from town to town, going door to door, getting people to vote against candidates who opposed prohibition. And Wayne Wheeler would say, people shouldn't drink. I was stabbed by a, pitch, a pitchfork when I was a child. And then they would say, oh, people can be stabbed by pitchforks as children? And Wayne Wheeler would say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you laugh? Because I was seeing two of you. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne Wheeler was going to churches to raise money. He was going to arrange demonstrations, and he was always on his bike. He was always peddling furiously. Wayne Wheeler invented pressure politics. Wayne Wheeler would say, this person is not strongly enough in favor of temperance, then that person would go down every time, 70 for 70. So Wayne Wheeler comes to Washington, D.C. and starts fighting for a constitutional amendment against alcohol. Everyone is afraid of Wayne Wheeler. Wayne Wheeler is the most successful lobbyist in the United States. Um, there was another thing that happened that I'm forgetting right now so that, I'll get, that I'll get back to, that I'll get back to Derek. But in the meantime, prohibition was passed and Wayne Wheeler won the day. Wayne Wheeler was such a zealot because once prohibition happened, that wasn't enough for Wayne Wheeler. He goes to see the head of the KKK. I'm a national figure. I can't do my own bidding, but you, Ku Klux Klan, can. So the Ku Klux Klan did it. They were Wayne Wheeler's private security force. And they um, would go into bars and just tear the f***ing place apart. The Ku Klux Klan was a violent organization. They were tarring and feathering people who were bootleggers. <laughs> Wayne Wheeler. Great name. Wayne Wheeler. Wayne Wheeler is so crazy because there was still industrial alcohol that was used to clean engine parts, to make nail polish. Wayne Wheeler said, we need to find a way to make that legal alcohol poisonous. We're going to add methanol to ethanol, call it formula number 30, and then anyone who drinks ethanol, not to clean engines, but to get drunk, will die. And that's when the sh** hit the fan. People who were drinking ethanol mixed with methanol didn't know that that's what they were doing. It made thousands of people sick and hundreds of people died. And Wayne Wheeler was saying, well, it's your own fault. You know about prohibition. You know alcohol is illegal. You're dead now. And people started thinking, why would my own government do this to me? Wayne Wheeler, who had been pretty much running the government as a lobbyist, was discredited. And that's when he went to Michigan and then died a few weeks later. Just because Wayne Wheeler was stabbed in the leg by a pitchfork by a drunken farmhand as a child, he had to spend the rest of his life making sure no one else had fun, no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> oh, God. It just oh, fell. you got it. I love that you're collecting the ice. All right. This is as drunk as I get. <laughs>